are very excited about uh, the upcoming Secret Church, and hopefully uh, you guys will be able to be a part of that. We encourage you to do that. Um, this is fitting right in line with the, the emphasis we began at the beginning of this year called Hoosier One, and just really coming back around our heart as a church that salvation was never meant to stop with us. And we want to take this hope, this truth, uh, the life we have of Jesus, and just share that with others. And so uh, Secret Church this year is going to be a very uh, unique focus on making disciples, and so so we really encourage you uh, if you're able to be a part of that, uh, and we are looking forward to it. So um, beyond that, well, good, good morning. Hope you guys are doing well. Thank you for joining us this morning and those that are joining us online. Uh, it's just, uh, we're, we're so glad that you're here. And if it's your first Sunday with us, we're especially glad that you trusted us to come. Uh, and hopefully you'll take advantage of that and, and let us connect with you. Um, there's a, a, a welcome desk in the cafe. If you didn't get to stop by and it is your first Sunday, we've got a gift for you. We'd love to, to get you to, to stop by before you leave today. Um, but we are, this is a great time if you're new or just uh, jumping back in. It's a good time. We're in Romans. We're continuing our study of Romans and we're specifically uh, in Romans chapter eight. Again, what is arguably one of the greatest chapters in all of scripture. Uh, and so last week was, I mean, it was a pretty incredible start for us as we talked about uh, the unbelievable promise that for those in Christ, there is no condemnation. Man, what a promise for us. Because of what we just celebrated is we have a risen Savior who has conquered sin, conquered the grave, redeemed and rescued us and breathed life into us. Man, what a, what a journey that we're on as, uh, as Christ followers. And so our hope is that you know that, that you're experiencing that, that you're walking in that truth this morning. Um, and if not, uh, that's our hope for you, that you will come to know that and put your faith and trust in Jesus. And uh, Romans 8 is just a, a great picture of what life in Christ is for us uh, and, and what it looks like to live out the truth of the gospel. And so Paul uh, just takes a snapshot in this, this one chapter. It's just loaded. Uh, with specifically what it looks like to live according to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that we uh, receive the moment we put our faith in Jesus, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit in us. And Paul is going to take some time and talk about um, what that looks like. And so this morning, the heart of this morning is uh, living as children of God. And, and just the profound truth that we find in uh, Romans chapter 8. And, and it may surprise you, but, but scholars actually debate a little bit about uh, the, the, the key uh, theme of Romans chapter 8. It's very loved by, it's a loved uh, chapter by many, um, but, but the, many debate about the central theme. Some say it's the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is mentioned 17 times in one chapter. So it's pretty important to Paul, pretty big deal. Uh, he wants to make sure we understand the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, living according to the Spirit. Um, and, and so uh, many scholars believe that's the theme, but then other scholars believe that the central theme is assurance, our assurance in the faith. Um, and we see that all throughout. I mean, we, we talked about this already, but uh, Romans 8 begins with the, the powerful truth that there's no condemnation, and it ends uh, with the truth that there's no separation for those in Christ. Uh, and so throughout verse 16, we're going to see this morning that the Spirit of God cries out in us, Abba, Father, assuring that we are the children of God. And then verse 35, that, that uh, we know that in Christ, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then earlier in 28, uh, Paul says, and God is working through all, thing, all things together for the good, even when we don't uh, see it, when we can't feel it. And so all of those speak to the assurance we have. And so uh, you can make a pretty strong argument that Romans 8 is also about assurance. And so I think you understand it best when you bring those two ideas together. Um, and that <clears throat> assurance in the Christian life comes from intimacy with the Spirit. That one of the Spirit's primary roles in your life is giving you assurance and leading you in the life that God has for you. And so, so we ask this question as we come to the verses we're going to look at today, and it's just how exactly does the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, give us assurance? Uh, and, 
And so uh, Paul's going to address that in, in, in our passage today, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. And I, I forgot to mention this, if you're following along on the app, another reason to go to the app uh, is we're also going to have a Who's Your One section in there every week uh, that really helps us take the truth that we're learning uh, and think about how we can share that with the person that we're praying for or looking to, uh, that, that person that we have a heart for. Um, maybe you don't know their name yet, um, but if you already know their name and you're already looking for that opportunity, uh, we want to be able to equip you to do that. And so, so we're going to, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter eight, verses 12 through 17. And here's what we're going to see this morning. As we look at this, um, it's easy to be, uh, confused about what exactly the role of the Holy spirit is and how uh, we live according to the spirit. But lucky for us and thankful, uh, we have God's word to lead us in truth and to show us how the Holy Spirit works in our lives and how we are to live according to that. And so, so that's what we're going to see. We're going to see three things this morning in these six verses. Uh, we're going to see the need of the Spirit, uh, the lead of the Spirit, and the assurance from the Spirit. That's the three things we want us to look at this morning. So let's, let's look at the passage uh, all together, and then we're going to break it, break it down. Uh, starting in uh, chapter 8, verse 12, let's read this together. So then, brothers, we are debtors. Not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I pray, for, pray with me this morning as we ask God to speak through his word. God, we thank you for the truth of your word and the power of this promise. God, we thank you for the, the Holy Spirit that's been given to us for those who have trusted in you and the promise for for those who haven't, that we will receive your spirit when we put our faith and trust in you. And so I pray this morning that, God, you would just reveal uh, the, the relationship we have, the depth of that, and how, what it looks like to live according to your spirit. Um, we pray that you would speak powerfully through your word this morning as we look at this together. And we're praying all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so first from these six verses, we're going to see the need of the Spirit. The Spirit enables you to fight sin. So, so verses 12 and 13, Paul explains that, that it's only in the Spirit that we can escape the power of sin. Uh, listen to verse 12 again. Uh, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Uh, and so then, the way he begins verse 12, so then points back to the point Paul made in the first 11 verses, namely that there's no condemnation in Christ. And so he's building on the, the, the truth that he's already taught us, and, and I want to show you why that's so important. Because it means for those in Christ that, that, have no long, that no longer have condemnation, he's saying Jesus put an end to the condemnation of sin through his death on the cross. And so we are no longer obligated to it. Uh, obligated, not obligated, means no longer bound to it. We know we're no longer captive to obey its desires. We no longer have to obey sin. Apart from our trust in Christ, we are ruled by the flesh. Um, and, and so Paul has made this case for how desperately we need Jesus and why Jesus came. And so the, con the, the fact that Jesus died for us, it sets Jesus' death releases us from the penalty of sin. That's the condemnation that Paul's talking about here because, because our sin separates us from God and we are powerless to change our condition, but Jesus came and lived the life that we could not live, the perfect holy life, and by doing that, he took our penalty upon himself. And so he sets us free from the penalty of sin. Um, but that's not, that's not all that he does. Uh, through his death, he sets us free from the penalty of sin. And through his resurrection, we are given the power of the Holy Spirit in us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And so he not only frees us from the penalty of sin, he frees us from the power of sin. 
Uh, and so it's important for us to understand this. You're, you're released from the penalty of sin by his blood, by Jesus' blood, and you're released by the power of sin, by his spirit. Um, and we see this again in verse 13. He says, for if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so as believers, we're not to live according to the flesh. Instead, we're called to put the deeds of of the, the, sorry, to put to death the deeds of the body. Um, and, and I really, I want to spend, give you a warning here because this is the last time Paul brings this up in chapter eight. Um, and so I want you to understand this. Even if you are saved, for those of us who have put our trust and our faith in Jesus, sin is still very much alive in you. There is still indwelling sin. And we should never forget that. Uh, because sin is a predator. It's always on the prowl. It's always seeking to destroy us. And no matter how far you've gone in the Christian life, no matter how much you've grown, no matter how faithful you attend church, no matter how much uh, you read uh, God's word, there's still an ongoing struggle. There's still an indwelling uh, sin. And it's important for us to remember, this is why the Puritan John Owen, he says it this way, you must always be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And so most of us, if we're honest, most of us flirt with sin and trying to tame it rather than killing it. Uh, you know, I heard, I heard a pastor describe it this way. He said, you know, that, that posture of trying to tame sin instead of trying to kill it is, he said, it's as silly as those people who make pets out of predatory animals. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but he referenced a story and this true story, right? And, and there's, there's several of these, turns out. This isn't that isolated, but this was a quote in a headline. It said, pet bear named Teddy kills Pennsylvania woman. It's a real, real fact. It really happened. Uh, this, room, this woman apparently raised a black bear cub, uh, for, raised a black bear from cub her, cubhood for nine years. And there were no incidents. For nine years. But then one day, the bear mauled her. The end. <laughs> and some of the neighbors acted surprised. We're talking about a bear, people. They were shocked. Um, they said things like this. She was such a good person. We just thought she had a strange hobby. Raising a black bear is not a strange hobby like collecting stamps or, you know, uh, scrapbooking, okay? It's a predatory animal, folks. Bears are going to do what bears do, right? And so how in the world, like, she just, I don't doubt that she was a nice person. You just don't raise predatory animals as your own. I mean, let me just tell you, if you have a predatory animal that you're raising, you know, a pet tiger, pet bear, um, my kids aren't coming over to play at your house. I'm just going to tell you. I don't care how tame they are or how well you've done. Um, that's not going to happen. And so the reality is you have to be killing sin or it will be killing you. My point is, Paul's point is, as a Christian, you always, be, you always have to be fighting sin with the Spirit. And it's only in the Spirit that you can hope to do this. Um, and that's where he says, if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, only then you will live. Uh, and so uh, another pastor said it this way. He said, fighting sin without the Spirit is like open hand slapping a bear. It's not going to end well. So, um, so many of you feel defeated in sin because you've been trying to fight the impulses of sin through the powers of the flesh instead of learning you've got to fight in the power of the Spirit. And so you hear that and you go, okay, that sounds great. That sounds all churchy. I'm supposed to fight in the Spirit. What does that look like? And so, good question. I'm going to answer that for you. Um, I wanted to give you guys, I wanted to, this morning to be practical as we walk through this to, so we can put this into practice. Um, and this is a process for fighting sin in the Spirit. Um, and, and so I just want you to, I, I want to just share five ways with you that we can do that. Um, and so uh, the slide's coming up, I think. Uh, and so here's the first one, the first uh, way that we fight. Humble confession. I mean, it starts with confession. You got to own it. You got to call it what it is. Um, again, I know I've already made this point, but this was another like image that just kind of stuck with me. I had a friend who shared about their son who was in the backyard 
and there was a snake in the backyard and the son like got up close to the snake and then uh, his dad just heard him say, hey, friend, friend. He just kept saying the word friend. And his dad came around to see what was going on. When he saw it was a snake, he said, buddy, that's not your friend. And he killed it. And the reason I tell you that, same story, same idea, same concept. We can't, we can't play around with sin. It will destroy you. Uh, and so, so it starts with owning it. It starts with addressing it. Uh, confess your sins. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 16 says, confess your sins to one another and you will be healed. Now, by the way, this doesn't mean you tell everyone everything, okay? It doesn't mean you just like, you know, spill your guts, tell your whole life story, and somebody's like, I just wanted to know how you were doing. I didn't necessarily want all of everything you've ever done to portray the Lord, our Savior. Thank you for that. Um, and so it doesn't mean you tell everyone everything, but you need to tell someone. You need to be able to confess that, to bring that darkness into the light. Um, and <clears throat> a friend, a counselor, your small group, uh, and so it starts with confession. The next, the next step is, is total surrender. Now, this is, this is in contrast to like a negotiated settlement with God where, you know, most people want to say, well, you know, what do I have to do to be a, a good Christian? Um, but here's the problem with that. To, to follow Jesus means to surrender completely. And when you say no to him, even about a small thing, you, you cut yourself off from fellowship with him and thus his power at work in you. Um, and so total surrender. Verse, the, the next one is reassurance in the gospel. And this we see, we're going to see as we get on into this passage that this is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit in us is reassurance of the gospel. The Spirit breaks sin's hold on you by reminding you of your full acceptance with the Father. Um, and we're going we're to see more of this, but, but the irony in the Christian life is that the only ones who get better are the ones who understand just how sick they are, just how broken they are, just how desperately we need Jesus. We never stop needing him. And, and so the power of a new life flows from assurance in the gospel. Uh, we saw this last week. It, it's a little bit, uh, it sometimes seems backwards for us, but we see this even in Jesus' ministry as he would, uh, we, we looked at the account of the, the woman caught in adultery as she was brought to Jesus. And Jesus' first, con first instructions were to her was, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And we often want to flip those two. Go sin no more, and I won't condemn you. Because we often think of faith as clean up your life, and then you can come to Jesus. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is while we were in our sin, while we were in rebellion, while we were broken, Christ died for us, demonstrated his love for us by dying for us. And, and so when we first, under, we first understand our acceptance, so Jesus, um, he put acceptance, neither do I condemn you, before change, go and sin no more. And so it's only through knowing that she was accepted that she had the power to change. And so the Spirit assures you of your acceptance with God. And then next, uh, memorizing specific scripture. And Jesus modeled this himself. I mean, we see this in, uh, in the Word. Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, what did he do? He quoted Scripture. He quoted specific Scripture that dealt with the temptations that he was facing. Uh, we see this, uh, Paul calls the Word of God the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 6. When he's talking about the armor of God, he, he calls God's Word the sword of the Spirit. Um, scripture is your, is your weapon for battle. So trying to battle sin without a knowledge of Scripture, or without understanding God's Word, is like going to a gunfight without a gun. Uh, and so not even Jesus would do that. And if, and if he needed to use Scripture, then we definitely need to use Scripture to fight off temptation. And so here's, a, here's an encouragement or maybe a challenge for you since we're in Romans. Why not commit to memorize Romans chapter 8? Um, you know, not, not in one day or anything. So you're like, I mean, you could. You, first of all, those of you that feel like you can't remember things, just stop and think for a minute about how much ridiculous information you have memorized. Just think about that for a minute. You're like, well, I, just, I can't really remember Scripture. You have crazy amounts of information that you have memorized. Trust me, you could do it. Um, and why not memorize something that's useful because half of the stuff you remember is completely useless. And so why not, why not use some of that brain power to remember something that's going to actually help you in the midst of temptation, in the midst of struggle? And so you can commit to memorize Romans 8. 
Um, and so listen, if our time together in the, on, on Sunday mornings is your only exposure to God's word, then you are ill equipped. You are not ready. Let me just go ahead and tell you, um, you know, your temptations to sin comes daily. And so your intake of scripture needs to be daily at least. Uh, and so, so we see, uh, next, uh, last thing we see is don't just avoid sin, pursue wisdom. Most Christians walk through life, and, and if we're honest, there's areas of our life where we just try to see, you know, how, how close can we get to the line without crossing it? Um, and, and walking in the Spirit, walking with the Spirit looks different. Uh, if you're walking with the Spirit, you're not just asking, you're, you're asking the question, what do you want in this situation? God, what do you want for me in this situation? It's not just how close can I get to the line and not cross it. It's what is the wise thing to do in light of your word in light of the story that I want to tell, what's wise here? Um, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that, that many things are, are lawful, but they're not helpful. And so that means that there are certain choices that may not be sinful per se, but it doesn't align you with the Spirit's will. And so it's not just about, uh, it's not only about avoiding sin, it's about pursuing wisdom and walking in a way that, that, that honors Him. Uh, and so those are, those are five ways you can, you can fight sin in the Spirit. And, and this is important because the Spirit of God is not merely trying to curb your behavior. He's, he's wanting to transform your heart. Uh, he, and He wants you to obey and trust God and follow His Word, not, not because you have to, but because you get to, because of the relationship you have. Uh, and so, so that's the beauty that we begin to see as the, the power of the Spirit in us. That's, so, so that's the need for the Spirit. But next, Paul turns to the lead of the Spirit, how, how the Holy Spirit directs us. Uh, we see this in verse uh, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And so as we, as we read this, we see, again, Paul is showing us not only why we need the Holy Spirit, but how the Holy Spirit leads us, why this is important, because we ask, led by, the, led by the Spirit, where? But when we look at the context, we see the answer to that. Um, and that's always your rule for Bible interpretation. Uh, look at the context. And when Paul says led by God's Spirit, he means led by the Spirit into Christ's likeness, into the works of life. It's actually a continuation of the verse before it. Um, and verse 13 and 14, originally uh, in, in the Greek, that was one sentence. There was a transition of because. Uh, and so, in other words, why are we given this great power, this power over sin through the Holy Spirit? Why is that available to us? Because we are sons or children of God. So being led by the Spirit must mean the same thing as putting to death the sinful deeds of the body. In other words, we're led to hate the things that the Spirit hates, and we're led to love the things that the Spirit loves in Jesus and His Word. And so the two sides we see here of the work of the Spirit is action and identity. Uh, if the Spirit is, is moving you, leading you, that's an action, and you can have insurance that you are God's children, God's child, which is our identity. Now, uh, or God's son, as the scripture says. Now, let me be careful, let me, or not careful, but let me explain something for a minute. Um, ladies, don't feel left out by the fact that Paul says sons here. It's not a, a, a mistype or, you know, whenever uh, he is talking to the body of Christ, he is talking to uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, but it's very specific that Paul uses the word sons here because uh, in those days, um, he uses sons instead of sons and daughters because in those days, the firstborn son is who got all the inheritance, like all the inheritance. So let, me, let me just explain that. So uh, this was different even than nowadays, how our inheritance is like spread out over the, over the children, right? Well, in those days, it was only the firstborn son that was given the entire inheritance because that was how families uh, in, in first century maintained their wealth and their position. They didn't divide it up. They maintained it and it was all given to the firstborn son. And so when Paul uses the word sons here, it's actually a valuing thing. It was, it was controversial in his day uh, for a different reason, not because it wasn't politically correct, but because 
Um, they would never assume where Paul uses sons and he's applying to the, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, that was controversial to them because women and weren't heirs. They weren't. And so Paul wants us to understand that we have all the possessions of Christ, that we are heirs um, with heirs of God. And so it's a powerful term uh, that you're a full heir. Just like men are included when Paul describes the church as the bride of Christ, uh, women should not be offended when the analogy of sons is used because in both cases, each of these, the bride of Christ and uh, sons of God, is used, each metaphor tells us something about our relationship with God. Uh, and so, so this is the identity that we're given, uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But, but the, the action of being led, if the Spirit is leading you toward Christ-likeness, you have assurance that you are God's sons or God's children. Um, and this is a gradual process, so don't, um, don't get discouraged uh, if, it's not hap- if it seems to be happening more slowly than you want. Um, it rarely does it happen in one big, dramatic uh, fashion. Um, it's kind of like watching your kids grow. You know, when you're in the house with them all the time, um, you kind of you kind of miss it a little bit until you're away from them for a little bit, or somebody comes to visit and they're like, "Good grief, you've grown so much!" Right? Um, and so, oftentimes, other people will see the growth in you even before you will. Um, but make no mistake, living according to the Spirit will create growth in you. Uh, it will grow you and. Um, I can tell you from experience that it's also painful. Uh, in fact, um, oftentimes God teaches you more through the, through the pain, disappointment, and, and humbling than he does through the successful times. You, you learn more and you grow more. Um, and, and so it's gradual, it's painful, it's slow. But if you're living according to the Spirit and walking in him, you will change. He will. His whole purpose is to make you more like Christ. And, uh, and so uh, you're moving in that direction. And, and so we see, uh, we, <clears throat> and so this leads us, we see the, the, uh, the action in our life flows from our identity. Uh, and, that, and so that, this next verse affirms the depth of this relationship. Uh, and so we've seen the need of the Spirit, we see the lead of the Spirit, and now lastly we see the assurance from the Spirit in these final verses, 15 through 17, um, we see three key benefits to, to being a child of God. And the reason I want to highlight these three is because this, these verses speak directly to these. Um, and so verse 15, we're going to see the intimacy that comes from being a child of God. Verse 16, we're going to see the confidence. And verse 17, we're going to see the inheritance. Uh, and so first, look at verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoptions as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And so what we see here in verse 15 is what it means to be a son of God, that we are given great intimacy. We have access to the Father because of the Holy Spirit, because of the Spirit that is in us, it leads us to cry out, Abba, Father. It gives us intimacy with God. Uh, now, Abba is not just the name of a band from the 70s. It's actually an Aramaic word for father. Uh, and, and here's something interesting. Maybe you know this, but virtually every language has a short, repetitive word uh, for, for father. Um, and so, you know, you've got... Uh, Dada, Papa, um, Indonesia is Bapa, Turkish is Baba. Uh, and so all, you know, on and on it goes. There's all these, and guess who comes up with all these words? Toddlers, right? Um, and, and the reason is humans have a deep desire within them uh, for security, for a parent to be loved, to be, uh, to be protected, to, to have that relationship, it's, we have that deep within us. Um, everyone desires that, a, a, someone who can take care of us. And that's why when we're little, we're crying out for that. Um, but we don't lose that as we get older. Those, that desire is still there. That need is still there. And here's what we find. Uh, no matter our earthly fathers, no matter how good they are, they can't, even they can't fulfill that. 
Um, because good dads eventually let us down if for no other reason than they, they can't be with us forever. Uh, and, and so we go through life looking for that fulfillment and security that we first yearned when we cried out, Daddy. And Paul says that God answers that yearning, that deep desire for relationship, for protection, for uh, comfort, for security, that God answers that in Jesus and by the, whole, by the power of the Spirit in us. Um, that's what leads us to cry out, Abba, Father. He releases us, and, and he begins to talk about the, uh, the spirit that that addresses. There's a spirit of, of slavery, a spirit of fear, but we weren't given that through the Holy Spirit. We're given a spirit of adoption that cries out, Daddy. Um, and so the, the reason, uh, I just want you to see this, these, the, 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 these two spirits. Um, here's the difference between a spirit of, of slavery and a spirit of sonship. Uh, just this, so first, that spirit of slavery, it obeys under compulsion because I have to. It works under the threat of pain or loss or punishment. It, it pays back. Um, it's rooted in insecurity. If I slip up, my master might beat me. It, the concentration is on external behavior and compliance with rules. Uh, it gets work, but no honor. And look at that versus the spirit of sonship. Children obey out of love and for joy in daddy. Discipline is not retribution, but loving instruction. Security, if I slip up, my father will forgive me. And the concentration is on relationship and attitudes. Um, you work in that situation, but you feel honored. And so, so we see that, that we are not slaves who need to be afraid. We are sons who stand secure. And, and so we see this, um, this intimacy that we have, this access that we have. Let me, just, let me just say it this way. You know, who dare interrupt a king in the middle of the night for something as trivial as a glass of water? You know who could do that? A son. There's a, there's a famous picture of uh, President John F. Kennedy surrounded in the Oval Office with all these powerful figures and dignitaries surrounded by all these people, and he's kneeling down and tying John Jr.'s tennis shoe. And like in the, in the presence of all these powerful people who would love to have a word with the president, right? Who's the president giving all his attention to? His son. That's the access that we have. Through the power of the spirit, we are given spirit, not of fear, not of slavery, but of sonship, of access, of a child of God, of a son and daughter of God, of the king. And... And so Paul wants us to understand how the Holy Spirit radically changes our relationship. And because of that, we have confidence to cry out, Abba, Father. We remember that he was forsaken so I could be forgiven. That, that in the garden, Jesus cried out, Abba, and faced silence so that I could cry out, Abba, and not be forsaken. And... He was forsaken so I could be forgiven. He was pushed away so I could have the assurance of always being drawn close. And that assurance changes the view of everything. I don't have to be afraid of bad circumstances because I know the overwhelming, the never-ending love of God is, is pursuing me, is rescuing me, is redeeming me, is surrounding me. Um, and I no longer need the assurance of good circumstances I can have joy and security because of my Father. That's the promise that we have. I mean, think about that. You know, in uh, uh, J.I. Packer, I love it. This is everything in Christianity. And this is what he says, this quote from J.I. Packer about adoption. Uh, he says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his whole outlook in life, he does not understand Christianity very well. There is no greater privilege. And it's not just intimacy, it's confidence in who our father is. That even when we go through hard times and we go through struggles, we know not only is he working for our good, but he's with us. We're not alone. 
And so, so we understand uh, this, this truth. This, uh, we see this in uh, verse 16. I don't know if we read verse 16 yet. Sorry. Um, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so how does that work? The Holy Spirit testifies along with, along with our spirit that we are the sons of God. It reminds us the assurance that we have as a child of God. Um, and I'm not talking about just a, a peaceful feeling that you always have. Sometimes it may feel like that. But sometimes it's a, a resolve to believe in the promises of the gospel, even when your heart is tempted to not believe or not feel it. In other words, through His Spirit, He might be saying to you right now in financial difficulty, you are my beloved child. In the middle of marital difficulty, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In the midst of an addiction, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed my, has he removed our transgressions from him. In a terminal illness, as high as the heavens are, so high is my love for you. Dealing with a wandering child. Surely he has borne our grief. But in those, we can believe these truths. The Spirit reminds us and testifies with us of who we are in Christ. And that brings us to verse 17. And the first part uh, of verse 17, we see, we see the, in verse 17, we see the privileges of being a son. And that's our inheritance. We have riches with the Father, but not ease and comfort. Uh, The first part of verse 17 says this, if we really, if we are really his children, we are also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. In adoption, when, uh, when a child is brought into the family, their name is changed. They now, everything that they, uh, all the debt that they owed has been paid. Um, All the possessions of the family is now theirs. I mean, think about this, this for a minute. Can you imagine how you'd feel if all of a sudden you found out you had like a rich relative you never knew, right? And you got a letter in the mail and it turns out they gave you their inheritance and you weren't their child, but all the rights that they gave their child, they gave you as well. Can you imagine that? That's... That's the promise and even greater. Everything that belongs to Christ belongs to us through the power of the Spirit. That's the promise we've been given, that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And so we have all the riches, the inheritance of the Father, but not ease and comfort. Listen to the rest of 17. Um, Provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. So, It's important to remember, life doesn't necessarily get easier because you're a Christian. Let's not get that confused. While our life will certainly be better, it will not be easier. In fact, there's a lot of ways in which being a Christian makes your life a lot harder. Um, And Paul indicates here where he's going to go next, that the road ahead for Christians is one of suffering. But that's actually a privilege. And I know you guys are like, what? What? How is that a privilege? But that's what Paul wants us to understand is that the life of a, of a Christ follower, life in Christ, there's going to be sacrifice. It's a life of service. It's a life of, of sacrifice. There's a fight against sin that we've already talked about. But there's also just the suffering of life that it gives us a completely different perspective on how we endure and how we walk through hardships and trials. Um, and ultimately, there's... There's things that we will experience um, just because we are Christ followers, as because we're following Him, we're suffering with Him, and and it also means that we don't do that alone; that He is with us. And so, ultimately, we're we're going to look at this more next week. But the ultimate question that we ask is: Is He worth it? Is Jesus worth it? And the answer is a thousand times yes. That's what Paul wants us to say and wants us to see that in this life there will be suffering and some of that suffering will become, will come simply because you are following Christ. 
but it is worth it. When we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. That is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. That's what it means to live according to the Spirit. It shows why we need the Spirit. It shows the lead of the Spirit in our life and the assurance that the Spirit brings as children of God. Um, simply put, through the Spirit's work in our life, we realize we're in the fight and we're in the family. And that's the promise of the gospel. And so, so how about you? Are you walking according to the Spirit? Are you living according to the Spirit? Are you being transformed by the truth of what it means to be a child of God? The inheritance we've been given, the protection we have, the intimacy to call him our Father, to know that he knows us, that he knows the very number of hairs on our head, and that he loves us. Are you experiencing that life that comes from the Spirit? How's he shaping you and changing you in that? As the band comes to lead us, I want to pray for us and the truth of, of our identity in Christ. Let's pray together. Father. Dad. What a privilege we have to call on you, to come to you, to know that, that, you, that you love us. That you love us so much that you sent Jesus. Jesus, you demonstrated that love by giving your life for us, breaking the power of sin in our lives where we could do nothing but obey our sin, sinful flesh. You made a way for us to have a new life. A life that's no longer characterized by obedience to sin. A life that's characterized by following you, trusting you, living differently, putting sin to death, experiencing the life in you. You didn't just free us from the penalty of sin. You freed us from the power of sin. And we praise you that not only, not only have you set us free, you have made us part of your family. That every, everything that's yours, Jesus, is ours. That we are heirs of God and co-heirs with you because of your work on the cross and because of your spirit alive in us. And so we pray that you would reveal to us what it means to live according to the Spirit and to walk with the Spirit and be transformed and made into your image and to know the profound truth that we are your children, God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.